Hello Year 9 and welcome to your English lesson. It is Wednesday the 1st of April 2020 and we are studying the Gothic horror genre. Um, so you'll remember from last lesson we started reading um, an Edgar Allan Poe short story called The Oval Portrait. Um, you did a couple of lessons ago um, some research on Edgar Allan Poe and many of you sent through to me and submitted via show my homework your um, research that you found out about him um, so well done um, and today we are going to continue reading the conclusion of this short story so let's start um, right so your L.O.'s for today's lesson. We're going to learn new horrific vocabulary. We're going to conclude our reading of the Gothic horror short story, The Oval Portrait, and we're going to explore the blood-curdling message behind the story. Are you ready, Year 9? Enter at your peril. Okay, so as always, it's a pre-1900 text, so there's lots of new vocabulary for us to learn. Um, this is a really, really important element of your learning. Um, as you already know, you will be asked to read some text from uh, the 1800 in your GCSE exam. So it's really important that at this stage of your studies, you start getting used to reading those sorts of texts and feeling confident with the fact that you're not going to understand every single word but what you will be able to do is understand much of it enough for you to be able to answer some questions on it and you need to get used to these this new and um, different vocabulary that's used um, back in the old days um, so I have picked out some words which I know come up time and time again um, in many texts from the pre-1900s so it's really really well worth your time now learning what these words mean so I am going to ask you in a moment to pause the video and either use a dictionary that you have at home or to go onto Google and look up on an online dictionary what these words mean and write them all down either on a piece of paper in a folder that you're using or your English book if you have that at home um, because these words are just going to come up time and time again so it's really important you learn them now. Um, so you will see I've picked out words that are essentially from this story. So we've got dissipate, imperceptibly, gilded, countenance, vehemently, slumber, dispelled, startling, confounded, agitation, austere, humble, withered, entranced, and tremulous. Okay, so if you go um, and you use an online dictionary, you will see that many of them have um, a little sound button next to the word. And if you press that, you will hear how the word um, is pronounced. Um, alternatively, you can rewind this video and you can listen to me um, and how I pronounce them. Um, either way, it will help you commit them to memory. And it's a really good idea if you have a go at saying them yourself as well. Um, so I'd like you to pause now. I'd like you to look these words up. It shouldn't take you too long. Please don't miss this part of the lesson out because you will struggle to understand the story if you haven't already looked these words up. And so in order to get the best out of this lesson, it's really important that you take the time now to look these words up and you will be given a little spelling test, a little vocab test at the end of the week with these words and the words that we learnt a few lessons ago. OK, so I'd like you to pause now, please. Okay, hopefully you paused and now you're back after finding out what all these wonderful words mean. Um, that means that you are now ready to read the story. Okay, for some reason it's gone a bit funny now. I'm going to go back. There we go. Can you see it better now? 
that's it okay um so we're going to start by reminding ourselves what happened in the first part of the story um so there was a man who we know um was very ill and um they were looking for somewhere to stay and they stayed in this house who remembers what the victorian word is for like an old imposing building that's right pile well done um so they found this pile and um they went in and it seemed as though it was abandoned um and it was in a pretty bad state really but they found somewhere now who remembers where the room was that they stayed in it was in a remote part of the building it was a little tower called that's right, a turret, well done. Um, and they slept in this room in the turret, remote away from everywhere else in the building. Um, and um, do you remember that the narrator um, had this uh, candelabra next to his bed that lit the room, but there was a part of the room that was in shadow. Um, when he moved the light and he lit that part of the room, what was there? What do you remember was there that he's never seen before? Yes, it was the portrait. And he sees this portrait in this um, little corner of the room and he's moved by it. Uh, so much so that he has to quickly close his eyes and look away and sort of compose himself before he looks at it again. Um, and we learn that there's something on his pillow. What is it that was on his pillow? That's right, it was a little book that told him the history of the paintings in the room. Um, and so what he decided to do was to flick through this book uh, to learn about this painting because it was, he was so moved by it. Um, now, what we know about this painting is very little at this stage and we're going to find out a bit more about it. So without further ado, let's move no, not that, sorry. Let's move myself down here. Hello, there we go. Okay. Now that I saw aright, I could not and would not doubt for the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas and seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses and to startle me at once into waking life. The portrait, I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders done in what is technically termed a vignette. Manner, much in the style of the favourite heads of Sully. The arms, the bosom, and even the ends of the radiant hair melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. Okay, let's just pause there for a second. Um, so, what do we notice um, in this first part here? Well, we see um, that... Uh, he could he could uh, make out this picture, this painting, um, when he looked at it the second time a bit more correctly. And um, he felt as though he was in a bit of a stupor, um, a sort of state of almost unconsciousness. Maybe it's the fever, maybe it's the way that the painting has moved him. Um, and um, But suddenly he saw this painting and it startled him awake. So he came out of his stupor um, and it was a painting of a young girl and we know that it's just her head and shoulders. Um, so they talk about this term, the vignette. Um, I'm going to show you. These are examples of vignettes. It's the idea is that a painting uh, doesn't have um, any specific borders. It's just you know, the portrait or the subject, and here is the portrait on this one, and it just sort of fades into the background. And you can see one here where it's not a portrait, um, it's a landscape, but it kind of fades into a background, there's no definite border. Um, so that's the sort of style um, of a vignette. So we can imagine now what this painting looks like. Um, and he talks about it being in the style of the favourite heads of Sully. And Sully um, was a, a well-known painter in the 1800s. Um, and here he is. 
uh, Thomas Sully, there he is, um, and he did a lot of portraits, actually mainly of women, and you can see why he was um, so famous is because his portraits seem to capture the real essence um, and personality of um, the people that he was painting. Um, so, you know, we've got this now, this impression um, of this vignette seemingly to be a bit like the way Thomas Sully uh, painted himself. Okay, uh, what we also learn um, is that uh, the, she had radiant hair um, and it just kind of melted into this uh, background. I suppose that's the style of the vignette, isn't it? Um, okay, let's read on. So we're here. The frame was oval, richly gilded and filigreed in moresque. Um, so just there, just to help you picture it, so gilded you already know is something that's covered in gold um, and filigreed is a sort of uh, fancy swirly sort of design um, and we're told that there's one that's a particular Moroccan design in Moresque and I'll show you uh, what that's like here. Um, so this is a sort of a filigree design here um, and this one here is the sort of uh, Moroccan style. So we get an image of this very richly decorated um, frame around this picture. Um, so now we can we can really picture it in our minds. Um, as a thing of art, nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself. But it could have been neither the execution of the work nor the immortal beauty of the countenance which had so suddenly and so vehemently moved me. Least of all could it have been that my fancy, shaken from its half slumber, had mistaken the head for that of a living person. I saw at once that the peculiarities of the design, of the vignetting and of the frame must have instantly dispelled such idea, must have prevented even its momentary entertainment. Okay, so we get this idea of this uh, vignette style painting, very well painted, like a famous painter, uh, with this very fancy gold frame, um, something very special. Um, and there's something about the beauty of the woman, um, but also uh, the countenance. Um, and you will know from looking up that word that it means the face, the expression. Um, and there's something about her face, something about her countenance that moves him so. It doesn't just move him, it moves him quite violently actually. It has quite an effect on him. Um, and he's not sure if it really is uh, just his fancy, his imagination, but it really has shaken him from his, and you'll know from looking this word up, it means sleep. Um, so it's it's really woken him up from his sleep. Um, but one of the things he notices um, is that he had mistaken the head for that of a living person. So it's so um, compelling, um, so lifelike, that actually he's starting to look at this painting and he thinks it's of a living person. Um, okay, let's move on. Thinking earnestly, truthfully upon these points, I remained for an hour perhaps, half sitting, half reclining with my vi vision riveted upon the portrait. At length, satisfied with the true secrets of its effect, I fell back within the bed. I had found the spell of the picture in an absolute lifelikeness of expression, which at first startling, finally confounded, subdued and appalled me. With deep and reverent awe, I replaced the candelabrum in its former position. The cause of my deep agitation being thus shut from view, I sought eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories turning to the number which designated the oval portrait, I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. So it becomes even more um, 
weird at this point because all of a sudden um, he's looking at this painting and he's riveted to it. He's stuck there staring at it, unable to move um, because it just has this spell on him. Um, and he suddenly, after feeling quite startled, and you will know what that means from looking it up, um, he then suddenly feels quite confounded. And again, you would have looked this up and you'll know what this means. Um, and then subdued. So then he becomes a bit more quiet, a bit more introverted at this point. Um, so he's gone through a sort of collection of different reactions. Um, and then he's quite appalled you know, it, he's he's appalled by this um, whole experience that he's had. Um, and he has this deep reverence, this deep respect and awe. So all of a sudden, I think he's slightly scared by it. He's in awe of it, but he's actually quite afraid of the power of this picture that's had on him. Um, and so what does he do? he moves the candelabra back to the position it was in before so that it's back into the into the shadows and he can't see it anymore and he decides he's going to go and find uh that book uh the volume the book um which has all the histories of the paintings and he decides to read about it and so now what we're going to do we're going to read what's um said about this painting in the in the book in the book and this is a quote from the book she was a maiden of rarest beauty and not more lovely than full of glee and evil was the hour when she saw and loved the wedded painter he passionate studious austere and having already a bride in his art she a maiden of rarest beauty and not more lovely than full of glee all light and smiles and frolicsome as the young fawn, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes and other untoward instruments which dis deprived her of her countenance, of the countenance of her lover. It was thus a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride, but she was humble and obedient and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark, high turret chamber, where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. So, in this part here, we're given quite a lot of detail, actually, about how this painting came about. We learn that she um, was a young... Um, a maiden can be a young and married woman, but in this case, she's actually um, his bride, and um, she's very beautiful. She's very full of, of happiness. Um, but we are told the evil, evil was the hour when she saw and loved the wedded painter. Um, so, you know, it wasn't a good moment for her when uh, she met and fell in love because we find out shortly uh, what happens to her. Um, and we learn about the painter. He was passionate studious so he worked very hard um and austere now if you look that word up you will know that he was quite a strict man um so uh you know he's interesting sort of mix of uh personalities here um and um what he loves about her is her glee, her happiness, her all light and smiles, frolicsome, she's fun, um, she's loving, um, but one of the things about her um, is that she hates only the art which was her rival. Now what do you think uh, Edgar Allan Poe means by that? She hates only the art which was her rival. Now why is the art her rival? We'll come back to that point. Um, dreading only the palette, that's the uh, board that a uh, painter puts all his paints on and uses, um, and brushes and other untoward uh, instruments uh, which deprived her of the countenance of her lover. Okay, so let's have a look um, at this. So we're told that art 
was her rival, not another woman. She's not jealous of another woman. She's jealous of art. And then we learn that the instruments that the artist uses, like the palette and the brushes, are these untoward instruments, these unwanted um, instruments, um, and they've deprived her. So they've um, stopped her uh, seeing the countenance. You remember countenance means face of her lover. Um, therefore, suggesting that she doesn't get to see her husband enough because he's always painting. So um, she does feel jealous of art because it's taking her husband away from her. But we learn about her being humble, being obedient. She does what she's told. Um, and she is sitting in that turret too. Maybe it's the same turret where the painting is and where um, the uh, narrator is sleeping. Um, okay, let's read on. But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went on from hour to hour and from day to day. And he was a passionate and wild and moody man who became lost in reveries so that he would not see <clears throat> that the light which fell so ghastly, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride, who pined visibly to all but him. Yet she smiled on and still on uncomplainingly because she saw that the painter who had high renown took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him yet who grew daily more dispirited and weak and in soothsome who beheld the portrait spoke of its re resemblance in low words as of a mighty marvel and a proof not less of the power of the painter than of his deep love for her whom he depicted so surpassingly well. Okay, what's happening in this bit? So we understand that he took glory in his work. So he's passionate about it, the detail. He's proud of what he's doing. Um, and we know that he spent hours and hours, days and days doing this. Uh, we know he's passionate, wild, moody. Um, so he's totally lost in this art when it goes wrong. He's moody, he's wild because he's so passionate. He wants to make this work. Uh, and he's becoming lost in his reveries, this idea of his dreams, his daydreams. He's, he's lost in them. He's not living in reality anymore. He's living in this dream world. Um, and he can't see the light falling so ghastly from that lone turret. So um, the light that's coming in, it's not giving life, it's almost taking life, it's so ghastly. And if you looked it up, which hopefully you did, you'll know about withered, um, the failing health and the spirits of his bride. So she's becoming more and more ill and the light that's shining down from the turret window um, is more and more ghastly and it's not healthy. Um, she pines visibly to anyone else, but he can't see it. So anyone who went up there, they would see that she was dying probably and he can't see it she smiled on and on because he's asking to paint her she's trying to keep the same pose she's trying to smile she doesn't want to complain and I want you to think about why she doesn't complain um, and why she does this um, and she knows that the painter who has hired and he's a very famous painter um, you know so she's in some ways she's privileged that he's painting her um, and he seems to have this um, obsession with painting her and that he can't stop um, and um, she loves him so um, but she gets more and more weak and dispirited she's losing her spirit and she's becoming more and more weak as the days go on while he's painting her um, and we can see that the resemblance is amazing. He says at the end of it, uh, you know, he depicted her so well. You know, he was able to paint her so realistically that it, it looks so much like her. Okay. Let's move myself over here. 
But at length, as the labour drew nearer to its conclusion, there were admitted none into the turret, for the painter had grown wild with the ardour of his work, and turned his eye from canvas merely even to regard the countenance of his wife, and he would not see that the tints which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her, of her who sate beside him. And when many weeks had passed, but little remained to do, save one brush upon the mouth and one tint upon the eye, the spirit of the lady again flickered up as a flame within the socket of the lamp. And then the brush was given, and then the tint was placed, and for one moment the painter stood entranced before the work which he had wrought but in the next while he yet gazed he grew tremulous and very pallid and aghast and crying with loud voice this is indeed life itself turned suddenly to regard his beloved she was dead That's the end. Ends just like that. You don't get any more from him. That's the end. Um, okay, so let's just have a look at that last bit there. Okay, so we know that um, from the beginning here, he says as he was getting to the end of his painting, he wouldn't let anybody in the turret at all. So no one was allowed in. He was wild with ardour, wild with passion. Um, and he only ever looked from the canvas um, to the woman's face, from the canvas to the woman's face, nothing else. Um, many, many weeks had passed. Um, and then we get this idea that he was able to absolutely, totally capture the essence of this woman's face in the portrait. And we see the spirit of the lady again flickered up as a flame within the socket of the lamp. And then the brush was given. And then the tint was placed. And there it was. He was there admiring it, entranced, and you've looked that word up so you know he was just totally entranced uh, by the vision of his work um, and he grew tremulous and pallid and aghast, he was filled with horror because when he looked at this painting he said this is indeed life itself, the painting looks alive. The painting looks like this woman. It is life. And then he looks over to his bride and she's dead in the chair. So with every stroke he built this picture of life. He was taking some of his life, her life, um, and putting it into the painting. Um, it's a weird and wonderful short story. Um, nice little twist at the end. Um, and it's sort of typical of Edgar Allan Poe's stories. It's not one of his most scary. We are gonna read some more of his scary ones, um, but it is a really good introduction to his writing style. And it's quite a short story as well. Um, so um, I'm going to direct you um, to Quizlet and on Show My Homework I'm going to put um, this link on to Show My Homework and you can find it at the end of this lesson. Um, there are some flashcard questions on there and I'd like you to go through those yourself and check your understanding of the story. You don't have to do it now, you can if you want to, you can pause now and do it but you can do it at the end, it's just fine at the end as well. Um, so what we're going to do now is we are going to check the statements that you think are true about this story. So, number one, the wife loved her husband so much that she would do anything for him. Okay, so I want you to decide whether you think that that statement is true. The husband didn't love his wife and hatched, that should be hatched with an ED, sorry about that, and hatched a plan to ensure that she died. Okay, so did he plan it all along? If you think that is true, make a note of number two. The husband loved his wife, but he let his passion for his art take over. Now, if you think that one's true, 
you can put down number three. Now remember, it doesn't mean to say that only one of these is true. How many of them do you agree with, okay? The wife, again, sorry with my, <laughs> my spelling errors, uh, my uh, errors in here. The wife had was pregnant. The wife was pregnant, okay? You know what I mean. The husband had been cheating on his wife before the start of the story. The narrator was dreaming the whole thing. Do you think that it was a dream? The husband became more interested in the painting of his wife than his actual wife. The wife enjoyed sitting for him while he painted. I think that one's true. Write down number eight. The wife was willing to sit for her husband because she loved him and wanted to make him happy. If you think that's true, write down number nine. And the wife was suffering while she sat there. Okay, so have one last look. Um, write down the numbers for all the statements that you think are true. Okay, here we go. Da -da, there. These are the ones that are true. So if you wrote down number one, number three, number seven, number nine and number ten, well done. Yes, you got those right. Um, okay, so I suppose the last thing to look at here is what is Poe's message? Um, in this story. There's something that he's communicating to the readers. Yes, it's it's a gothic horror story. Yes, it's meant to have an impact on us. We're meant to be shocked by it, maybe even a little bit afraid of it. Um, but there is, there is actually a message in here. Any ideas what it might be? I'll give you some clues. Something to do with passions, work, dreams. At this point, I would like you to pause the video and write down what you think uh, Poe's message is to us readers about this story. So do that now. Okay, hopefully you paused the video there and you wrote down what you think um, his message is uh, to the readers. Um, what is he telling us? What's he hinting? What, what lessons are we meant to learn? Um, what do we learn from this story? What can we learn from the painter's mistakes? Hmm. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what I think it could be. It's just my opinion. Okay, I've put down, uh, don't allow your passions and dreams to take over from the things that count in life, the people you love and care for could be something like that, couldn't it? Or, or keep yourself grounded and always remember the things in life that count. The people who care for you don't neglect your relationships. What do you think his message was? I would like you to submit to me or show my homework what you think Poe's message was in your own words um, and I will share some of these um, at our next live lesson. Thank you. You did it. Well done. You read um, a text that's really challenging, written in the 1800s, um, learned loads of new words, um, and you were able to understand it. And hopefully you're going to be able to share with me what messages you think Poe um, was sharing with us with his story. What do we learn from the painter's mistakes? Now, um, I'm still going through the wonderful gothic horror uh, setting descriptions um, and hopefully um, I'll be able to share some of those with you next lesson. Um, I'm just going through all of them. There's lots to go through and they are fantastic so far. So well done. Keep up the good work. I took in loads of submissions today as well on show my homework from lots of you um, and I'm going through all of your work um, and seeing all the hard work that you're doing at home. So keep it up. Well done and come and join me tomorrow for your next live lesson.